Hello, let's do it. First Corinthians chapter seven's got your name on it. So I don't want to deny you. Better read this scripture that has your name on it. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Something silly to say. Uh, first though, before we get to that. Father, thank you for thank you for what's going on. Thank you for letting us be here in this time. Thank you for giving us strength, your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us knowledge and wisdom. I ask for that knowledge and wisdom for all of us. And discernment, most importantly, discernment, so we will know what is of you and what is of the enemy. Do not let us be fooled. Please, Father, I pray that for all of us, all who are watching, all that we know, all who share this. Pray for wisdom, discernment, understanding, and revelation. That gift of prophecy. Because Paul told us to pray for that. So if that's your will, that's what we want to have. Because we want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forget what we want. <laughs> How arrogant and selfish people have become to where, well, God wants me to be happy. I don't see that promise in Scripture. Life and joy. But it is about building our strength of character as well. Father, that's what I believe. Of course you want good things for us. As your word says, for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So many, even pastors, I see, leaving that part out and are called according to your purpose because they want only what they want. And you promised that, Lord Jesus. You said that this was going to happen. In the final days, men will gather unto themselves men who will tell them what they want to hear and tickle their ears. And I'm seeing that so much, so much, Lord. Please open Open my fellow brothers and sisters in you. Open their eyes, their hearts, their minds, their ears. Father, please bring a passion for your word. Bring a passion for your word. All the answers are there. All the directions. Lord Jesus, you said if we love you, we will follow your commandments. We actually have to read them before we know what they are, don't we? So, Father, please bless this time. And all who listen, let them be blessed by your word and encourage them to read it for themselves, Lord. In your name, Christ Jesus, Lord Yeshua, amen and amen. Oh, awesome. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 7. This is the New American Standard Translation, which is the closest you can get to the original scrolls and tablets. And that's all I'm interested in. I don't need somebody else deciding if that's maybe a little too harsh, that language. Oh, gosh, I don't want anybody thinking that Jesus actually has a tough side. <laughs> now concerning the things which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Great. Well, that ruins everything. <laughs> but, <coughs> my apologies. I uh, still have this cough hanging on after all that bout with pneumonia. Anyway, verse 2. But because of immoralities, each man, whew, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. And I do believe he's talking about sexual. The wife does not have authority over her own body. And this is why I think this. The, uh, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have uh, authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do you know how few pastors ever even preach on this because they freak out that they might offend the women in the congregation and the women 
will get all upset and the women will leave and the women will take their kids with them and, the, and they'll lose attendance in church. I'm not kidding. This is why they don't preach on this kind of stuff, especially with what's coming. Weak, feckless. That's what I think about a whole lot of men right now who are afraid to actually read God's word and go, like it or not, hate to see you go, but I didn't write the Bible. I merely chose to believe and follow it. And when I've had this discussion with other Christians before, it's always, I always get, and they say they're Christians. And even Paul himself said, uh, so-called brothers in Christ, or so-called brother in Christ, as we read earlier. What was that, 1 Corinthians 5, I think? Anyway, um, I've had so-called brothers in Christ, uh, this discussion with them, and, and they bring up the whole, well, if I'm supposed to follow everything the Bible says, what about, and they bring up all this example after example after example from the Old Testament. And my response is easy. <laughs> I don't live there. I don't live in the Old Testament. I live in the New Testament. Jesus came to earth. He is my Lord and Savior. It is a New Testament. He ended the Old Testament. So if you want to keep dragging it up and you want to keep living by that and using that as an example of why I'm not supposed to follow things in the New Testament, then you, my friend, are high. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how else to put it. You must be. You must be on something. Stop it. Verse 3. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. Verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does and likewise. Also, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. That sounds pretty equal to me. Verse 5. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote, uh, devout, devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Lack of self-control, Paul writes. Who, according to the scripture, I don't think he was ever married. Lack of self-control. Well, yeah, buddy. You're right. You're right, brother. I can be accused of that. I'm guilty of this lack of self-control you speak of, uh, which is why I'm so careful now. I don't date. I'll meet for coffee. I'll get together, especially if there's other people around. I have to be careful because I'm an excitable boy. I don't want, I don't want to do it my way anymore. My way is stupid. I've made some pretty ridiculously tragic mistakes. Now it's the Lord's way or no way. And I'm going to learn about a sister in Christ Jesus. Learn about her. Become friends with her. And my friend Michael Baggett, pastor at uh, Bridges, Christian Singles group that gets together at uh, Life Community Church in Roseville every Sunday night at 5 o'clock. There's a little plug. Uh, pastor Baggett has been so helpful in getting me to understand this is serious. God's word is serious. And so many things I was always so serious about. Oh yeah, I, I want to read the word. No, no, I'm really dedicated. I'm a true follower of Christ Jesus. However, I really love women. That's my drug right there. That's my weakness. I gave up all the other drugs I was doing when I got saved when I was 31, living like a rock star in the San Francisco Bay Area on the radio and TV. Living like a rock star, I really did. Drugs and all. But now, I'm far more interested in pleasing the Lord than I am myself. That's why I say it's so important to do it the Lord's way or no way. And if you're a believer, but you're still doing it with boyfriend, girlfriend, but we're engaged, I don't remember reading that stipulation in Scripture. Knock it off. Somebody get in there with a crowbar and pry them apart. 
It's for their own good. <laughs> oh my goodness. Seriously. I, that, the, the women, that's been the toughest thing for me because I really do, I really like women. Um, but this I say, verse 6, by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. In other words, stay single if you can. However, each man has his own gift from God. Amen. One in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. There's as much or maybe even more divorce in the church than there is in the world. How do you justify that? Pastors, why aren't you reading this to your congregation? What is wrong with you? Seriously, this is a very serious question. What is wrong with you? You're leading people astray by omission. You're leaving this out. Well, we'll skip over that part. We don't want to offend the women, especially. We don't want them leaving. We need to keep people in the seats. We need to keep the, the coffers full. If that's truly what's driving you and that's what you're the most interested in and not the actual winning of souls for Christ Jesus, being open and used by God's Holy Spirit, we're just to throw out the seed where it lands and on what kind of soil. But we are to preach the gospel whether people like it or not. And this is very important, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I've had so many pastors get angry at me when I bring this up and talk to them about it. Now, why do they get so angry? People who get immediately angry, to me, that's because they're guilty. So, let's go back, verse 10. First, uh, First Corinthians 7, verse 10. But to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, but I say that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. Any brother that has a wife who is an unbeliever, listen, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her, and vice versa. I threw in that part. Verse 13, and a woman who is, uh, has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Listen carefully to right here because I've never heard a pastor. I got saved when I was 31. Now I'm at least a few decades past that. I've never heard a pastor even refer to this scripture right here I'm about to read you. 1 Corinthians 7, chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, let's back up to uh, verse 13. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. Are you catching this? And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Why have I never heard a pastor even read that in front of a congregation? You're a follower of Christ Jesus. You're married to someone who's an unbeliever. 
or even falls away from the faith and says, forget it, I want nothing to do with any of it, I'm going to be, belong to some cult. They start following a cult. But you stay faithful to the Lord. Your spouse will be saved, will be sanctified through being married to you. And it's all for the sake of your children that you have, if you have any. Are you getting that? That's the power of marriage to God, how important it is. And yet we throw it away. In the church, we throw it away all the time. If I hear one more Christian, oh, they were mean to you? Oh, they talked to you that way? <gasps> That's awful. You don't deserve that. Get out. Divorce him now. Divorce her. Oh, she did that. She said that. Oh, I wouldn't put up with that. Get rid of her. Stop it. Stop, stop saying that. And I hear this. I hear this in the church. I hear my own brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus talking this way. And then I'm over there going, no, 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 please, please, no. Reconcile. No, pray for them. The word's very serious. Don't leave unless for reasons of infidelity. As Jesus preached in Matthew, I've had pastors get so angry at me because of what I am saying right now. I'm like, are you reading the same scriptures I am? How do you justify this? How do you justify not preaching this? Obviously, I'm very passionate about this because, well, I got stories. I've got heartache. Very passionate about this. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. So is that suggesting to you that if you go ahead and get a divorce because, oh shoot, we got married so young and we just fell out of love. I've heard that too. Fall back in. Find a way. Pray. Do it. Come on. Stop talking that way. If nothing else, just stop talking that way. And if you're unwilling to repent and to ask for forgiveness, please, Lord, forgive me for being so selfish and doing what I wanted to do. I should have stayed. Your word is qu quite clear. No, you have pastors out there making excuses for you and getting angry at guys like me for daring to say, wait a minute, have you actually read scripture? This is very, it's seriously, this is obviously a very, I don't know if anybody will even watch this. Uh, when it's all said and done to stand, and it, thank you, David. I don't know what that means, but thank you. Somebody left a message there. Um, let's just keep reading. So I'm just wondering, though, serious. Okay, all right. I keep saying let's just, I keep thinking, I don't, I, I don't want to whip that dead horse. Unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. So if you get a divorce, just for reasons other than infidelity, does that mean that your children are unclean if they're not believers? Yes, actually. This is exactly, I believe, what he's saying. If you have any thoughts on it, send me a personal message. If I'm way off base, I'd love to hear how, because I'm just reading it. Verse 15, yet if the unbelieving one leaves. Now here's, here's what happened in my marriage. Unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases. That's what happened with me but I didn't care, I was gonna stay 
in the marriage because I said I would. I made a promise as I begged her one of the time. I said, I've never begged anyone and I'm begging you, please don't do this. Because you're breaking a promise to the Lord. Forget me. You don't have to live with me. Go do whatever you need to do. Get it out of your system. Get it done. Get away from me. Whatever it is. She hated how much I gave my time away to the church and money. The biggest fights we ever got into were over tithing. Because I said, no, it's very important. We should do this. And it just she hated that I was giving away our money. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. If you got, did you get that? But God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O oh wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, O oh husband, whether you will save your wife? Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each in this manner, let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. Awesome. Gladly. You are bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then that this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. It's too bad. I would, I would really, I would love to know what it's like to be in a godly marriage. I would love that. But Paul's telling me, he said, he said, concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion, as one who is by the mercy of the Lord, one who is, uh, who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then that this in view of the present distress. Okay, so it's his opinion that I shouldn't seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. <laughs> uh, might have a great point there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my apologies. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none and those who weep as though they did not weep and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice and those who buy as though they did not possess and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it for the form of this world is passing away. In other words, time is short. Start concentrating on what the Lord needs from us and wants us to do. But I want you to be free from concern. Verse 32, one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Gosh, I wonder what that's like. <laughs> this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, 
but to promote what is appropriate and secure to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. But if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth and if it, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let her marry. Now that's... Somebody needs to explain that to me, that verse. But if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let her marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority. Now, I'm not. Let her marry. See, I, I, this verse is, uh, real honest, uh, confusing to me. Because it's sounding like, hey, your daughter's here. I got to be way, I, I'm misunderstanding this, I hope. I mean, we pray for the Holy Spirit to give us understanding. And I'll read things a hundred times. And then the hundred and first time I'll go, I get it. Thank you, Lord. We get revelation. This one's tough for me. I don't get it. Verse 36. Do you understand it? Let her marry. Hmm. Verse 37. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. To keep his own virgin daughter. Again, what does this mean? If only there was some pastor who would actually talk about these things. Uh, so then both he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. A wife is bound as long... This can't be... Yeah, I don't get, I don't get it, Vicky. I don't... I don't get both, all three of those verses. Uh, it can't be talking about, he can't be writing about a sexual thing. Please no. Well, for one thing, that's a no because then she's not a virgin, is she now? So he's talking about keeping her in the house. Oh, nobody wanted to marry my daughter, so okay, she can keep living here. Is that it? Is that all it is? Okay. Uh, verse 39, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I also have the spirit of God. Wife is bound as long as her husband lives, and vice versa? Because all the other things he's saying, and likewise, male, and likewise, female, and likewise. But in verse 39, he just said, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives. What about the other way around? I'm going to tell you, uh, 1 Corinthians verse 7 obviously has uh, some... Um, some confusion for me. Again, if you have any thought on this or you have any clarity on any of this, let me know, would you? Otherwise, Lord willing, talk to you tomorrow. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Right, right? Oh, go back and reread that, by the way. And ask the Lord for his Holy Spirit to help you understand. Maybe you can explain it to me. <laughs> See ya.